Hello and welcome back to the Sam Beast YouTube channel. My name is David Foxen and on today's item shorts we're talking to Tony Crawley again about savings but not cash savings. What do you mean? There's other savings that ITAM can do? Absolutely. Tony explains how as we enter into our cloudy, sassy era within ITAM that we can actually deliver a different type of savings in the gift of time to our cloud architects and our project boards and governance control functions. But hey, I'll let Tony discuss and explain all of that as we dig into the video and we hope to see you next time. I think, you know, what we think what we do delivers value. We've got some great case studies now. And what, you know, I used to always, you know, my background is very commercial. So I'm always assessing value by by the savings the we money. deliver. Yeah, the no, money. you're right. You're right. And, and our benefits used to be, well, we mitigate risk and, and cost. But what I was constantly finding is that the CIOs and the people who are leading these cloud programs, time is of a massive thing right yeah. and what we do we you know for example if a li people look at licensing right at the end right before it goes across to the cloud or wherever right if we can get and what what may happen then is they may they're caught between well we have to re-engineer the system or the design which will take a huge amount of time or cut the cost on on the inefficient licensing and it's a horrible position to be in right and it just, you know, we we lessen the, the kind of time delays on the program. And also some of the contracts, if you think about it, a legacy, right? If you've got a contract from five years ago, it's perfectly plausible. That's probably not going to contemplate the technologies that your organization is dealing with. Yeah, That creates mass confusion, right? And delays. Can we, can't we? Um, and again, that part of things, less sorting that out in terms of the licensing, that was a massive benefit. I never really kind of seen that that, that people benefit. So it's time as well and program efficiency. Tony, it's really cringy and embarrassing to say this, but um, when I was implementing ITAM, when this was when I was younger. I just want to really clarify it when I was younger. It was a friend of yours, right? Huh? <laughs> It was a friend of yours. Oh, so that's a better, yeah, yeah, better one. A, a friend of mine um, was implementing ITAM when they were a lot younger and less uh, experienced. And um, yeah, they may have said in a meeting with some senior, I can't believe I'm saying this. They may have said this in a meeting with um, some senior managers when trying to promote the ITAM, that ITAM can give, give the greatest gift of all, the gift of time. And I still get WhatsApps with people to, that are there reminding me of that today because the way I, in my head I had it as like this grand item can really help you reduce time. But the way it came out was like I was in like a Hollywood film or something. I was like, oh, no. Yeah, but but I, I think you're right. Right. And and time for these, if, you, if you're in a big program where you've got to get out of a data center or something by a certain amount of time, and you've got a licensing issue, which the vendor, you know, let's, let's be honest. Yeah. We, the vendor is unsure of the position because, as I says, those legacy contracts cannot contemplate the technologies that we're talking about now. And that's kind of an issue that, you know, is only going to accelerate. And if if you can somehow cut through that, um, you know, it goes beyond the benefits of what we think often is, a, is, is you know, involved in asset management cost cost and risk. It's time is, is another big one. And of course, another one, sorry, David, is, is ITAM acceleration because if you're if you're linked to these big programs of change you can use that wave of change to establish your ITAM procedures for you know after that period of change when you are in the cloud or whatever because there's a huge amount of resource a huge amount of replanning yeah. that goes into that so as someone who's big into the commercial side of thing you know obviously you, you've worked with a lot of clients on moving to cloud and subscription-based services that must mean that you're a fan of FinOps right it is. And like I said, we we look at kind of um, I'm often inspired by people outside of yeah. kind of the traditional item. And in fact, I'm going to roll it back a little bit more from FinOps. But yes, that is a, that is <laughs> absolutely true. But software economics, let's let's roll it back to the basics, because I think 
sometimes in IT asset management, there's just a mindset of of software as as almost a physical sort of yeah. thing, right? And the truth is that it is such a, a different beast. And if if you look at the field of software economics, it's actually quite a mature field of study, right? Which I was kind of unaware of. And if you look at it from a vendor's point of view, it, it's a really unique product they're making, right? It requires a vast amount of upfront um, resources, okay? And I used to think, listen, I'm, I, I used to think vendors were, you know, money mad pirates, yeah. And, you know, I've got a rail again because you know how I feel about independence and, and yeah. all of that. It's very important. And I used to think there were money mad pirates that must be stopped at all costs. And, you know, it, it's true. Right. But if you look at the economics of it, it requires a vast amount of up, upfront fixed cost. Uh, but strangely, there's virtually zero marginal production costs, right? So, you know, if I was making a thousand cars, I'd need, you know, robots and materials and yeah. stuff. Whereas you can create, once you've developed it, you can infinitely copy, you know, software an infinite number of times, right? So there's no, none of that. So they've got to sell so much. It, it, they, I think it was Satya when he came into Microsoft, everybody should either be making code or selling code. No one else should be doing anything else apart from those two things. And I understand that because, because they've got these vast, sort of upfront investments yeah. that they need to cover. So the sales machine has to be um, huge. It has to be be well run. And of course, when you look at um, the sales of it, because you've got no marginal cost of production, you can have very incentivized sales step, right? So you, people can earn a lot of money on the sale of software, and that's absolutely fine. But the second component to it is you've got highly complex pricing, right? And yeah. that's that's just to do with the nature of what we're dealing with. Software is almost completely disassociated from hardware now, completely. Um, and those two things are the hallmarks of a mis-selling industry, right? If it was, you know, against the consumer, right? So they, this would be the same as pensions mis-selling. It would be the same as, you know, complex mobile phone tariffs. It would. Those are the same two characteristics. And when you look at it from that perspective, you understand the vendors a little bit more, but you can understand the sales process a little bit more and what, what drives those behaviors. And I think th just that background coming from sort of the basics of it helps, I don't know, it helps me understand that how software kind of is bought and flows through an organization.